Welcome to lecture six, the first in section B of this course on viscoelasticity. Now, in the introduction to section B, you will have seen a variety of very interesting and fascinating viscoelastic flow phenomena. The Weissenberg effect, how liquid climbs up a rotating rod. Extradate swell, where when a viscoelastic fluid emerges from an orifice, it can swell to many times the orifice diameter. And if that orifice has a complex shape, for example in an extrusion, how the extradate can deform, sometimes beyond all recognition. We've seen self-siphoning, a very, very counterintuitive behaviour that has great ramifications for process engineers. Imagine that your chemical process is producing a reactor full of a viscoelastic fluid and it has an overflow as a safety device to prevent overfilling. The slight overflow at the beginning of the process due to process upset suddenly results in your entire reactor inventory emptying due to self-siphoning. That's, that's not going to look good if you're not familiar with what self-siphoning is. We've seen also the very counterintuitive phenomenon of elastic turbulence, chaotic flow at vanishingly small Reynolds number. Now, we don't want to be in the dark about why these phenomena happen in viscoelastic liquids. These phenomena happen because of a combination of stress memory and normal force. The stress in a viscoelastic fluid is no longer instantaneously related to the rate of deformation as it is in a Newtonian fluid. Viscoelastic fluids have time memory and we'll explore the origin of the time memory in this lecture. This normal force that we mentioned is because that the stresses are no longer uniquely aligned with the deformation rate. If we have a shear deformation, for example, then that shear deformation is also capable of generating stresses in the principal directions. The final lecture in this section will develop the mathematical framework which will illustrate this really very very beautifully. So what we're going to do to start with in this lecture is look at how we can model viscoelasticity. There are a couple of approaches but we will be taking predominantly one approach. We're going to revise some properties of some mechanical elements, Hookian springs and viscous dampers. And we're going to obtain expressions for stress, strain and strain rate in each of these individual elements, the spring and the damper, and in combinations of these elements. And it's combinations of these elements that give rise to the models that we're going to be using for the rest of this section. So, let's start by thinking about springs. In my hand is a theraband. It is a elastic strap used by physiotherapists to torture people when they're injured. Now, this is very good to illustrate the properties of a spring. Um, it's not a Hookean spring. We'll demonstrate why it's not a Hookean spring. But the key point is that when a spring has a strain applied to it, it stores energy. I need to apply work to the spring to extend it, to strain it. And then that energy is stored as an elastic force that if I suddenly remove the tension that I'm keeping the spring apart with, that elastic energy is released and deformation and motion results. If this was a hooking spring, I'd be able to extend it infinitely and the stress stored in the spring would be directly proportional to its strain, its, its extension. This is, this is non-Hookian because as I get to about there, I can't extend it any further and the stress is increasing in a non-linear fashion with the strain. So, Hookian springs are not therabands. Hookian springs are idealised, but the important concept is the storage of strain energy. So, let's have a look formally at a Hookean spring. So on the blackboard I have an idealised diagram of a spring. Let's say it starts at rest and I then extend it and we quantify that extension as a strain. So there we have the extended spring and in order to impose a strain gamma, no not gamma dot, that's strain rate, the strain gamma, I've had to apply a stress tau. The resistance to that stress is a spring modulus G. So if we want to know what the state of stress is in our spring, tau equals strain times spring modulus, tau equals gamma g. Now, springs are all well and good, but we need another type of mechanical element 
to make what we're calling a phenomenological model, a mechanical analogue to a viscoelastic liquid. The second mechanical analogue we need is a viscous damper. Now, a viscous damper is very well illustrated actually with a bicycle pump. So a bicycle pump is basically an open cylinder with a piston in, and as I push down on this plunger, the piston moves, compresses air in the bottom of here, and forces out of this nozzle into my bike tyre. Now, let's say I impose a strain, a displacement, on my viscous damper. There we go, there's my viscous damper strained. I don't have to apply any force to keep this viscous damper in that strained position, do I? The only force I have to apply is when I change the strain. So there we go, I've changed the strain and I've had to apply a force to do that. And I re release that force and there's no storage of energy. There's no rebound like there was in the spring. So the viscous damper only requires energy to move and it presents as a viscous loss. And so the viscous damper, when it moves with a strain rate gamma dot, requires a force tau to move it. So let's look at that formally on the board. Here is a diagram of a viscous damper. There we have a piston moving within a viscous liquid. We are going to apply a stress, tau, and the result of that stress is a change in displacement. In fact, the result is a strain rate. When I remove that stress, the strain or the extension remains exactly the same. And an ideal viscous damper actually obeys the Newtonian constitutive law. The stress tau is equal to my fluid resistance eta times the strain rate gamma dot. So that is a viscous damper. Now, what we can do is to make combinations of springs and dampers. And in doing so, we generate phenomenological elements, mechanical analogues, of what a viscoelastic fluid might look like. So, the first element we're going to have a look at is the Voigt element. It's a spring in parallel with a viscous damper. Now, I'm going to label the spring part one and the damper part two. If we think about the stress in the system, assuming that there is a strain already applied, then the stress in the spring tau one is going to be different to the stress in the damper, because the damper doesn't have any stress at, at rest, tau 2, and the sum of those two stresses equals tau. Now, if we think of the strain that this element sees, element 1, the spring, sees the same displacement when I stretch it as the damper element 2. So gamma is the same both in element 1 and element 2. So what we say is that we have stress additivity, tau equals tau 1 plus tau 2, but strain continuity, gamma equals gamma 1 equals gamma 2. Now, Voigt elements are very good at describing creep. We can also use a Voigt element to illustrate what we mean about time memory in a viscoelastic fluid. So, back to my bicycle pump and my theraband again. Now, let's say I have a strain system. So my void element I'm going to apply a strain to. So let's say there's my strain in my bicycle pump and the same strain is going to be in my theraband. There we go. Now, if I was just dealing with a Newtonian system, I would change the strain of the bicycle pump, change its displacement, and there'd be no residual stress. Moreover, the motion would cease to exist once the stress ceased to exist. However, let's see what happens now. Now, let's say that this strain is a result of a steady deformation that's happened over time. I'm now going to stop that steady deformation. A Newtonian fluid, the stress would fall to zero. For a viscoelastic fluid that's modelled by a Voigt element, the stress slowly decays. And we can see that the displacement, the strain, is still changing even now, several seconds after I stopped that original deformation which caused the displacement. So there is the origin of time memory in viscoelastic liquids. It comes around as a combination of elastic stresses due to polymer chain extension, 
versus viscous stresses which retard the relaxation of that polymer chain. Now, for the purposes of our course, we're not going to be using Voigt elements. So we're going to introduce another combination of a viscous damper and a spring instead. So now on the board, we have a viscous damper in series with a hooky and spring. And again, what we're going to do is we're going to call the spring element one and the damper element two and look at the stresses and look at the strains. So if I was to apply a stress to this system, I would cause a displacement to happen. So strains would happen. But if we think about how the strains happen, the displacement of the spring can be independent from the displacement of the damper. So gamma one here, if I had a very, very low spring modulus, might extend very quickly. So gamma one might be large. For the same system, I could have a very high viscosity in the damper and it might barely move at all. So gamma two would be the strain for the damper, which is going to be independent from gamma one. If we think about the stresses, however, if we make a cut in this um, element anywhere, the stress will be the same. It will be the same either side of the damper and it will be the same in the spring. So now what we have is strain additivity. Gamma for the entire Maxwell element is gamma 1 plus gamma 2. We have stress continuity. The, strain, the stress in the spring tau 1 equals the stress in the dash pot tau 2 both of which equal the overall stress, tau. So what we've done is to introduce two elements that we can use to model viscoelasticity from a mechanical standpoint. We call these phenomenological models. Phenomenological viscoelastic models include the Voigt element, which we saw was a spring and a viscous damper in parallel, and the Maxwell element, which is a spring and a viscous damper connected in series. We saw that a Hookean spring is an energy store. The amount of stress required to produce a displacement is related by tau equals gamma, our strain, times g, our spring modulus. A viscous damper only dissipates energy whilst it's moving. So tau in this case is eta gamma dot. Voigt elements are good for creep and also good for illustrating why viscoelastic fluids have stress memory. In a Voigt element, we have stress additivity because the two elements are in parallel, the spring and the dash pot. So tau equals tau one plus tau two. We have strain continuity. The displacement of both elements is the same for the overall displacement of the element. We're going to be using Maxwell elements predominantly. And for a Maxwell element, a series connected spring and dash pot, we saw that we have strain additivity as a displacement of the spring and the displacement of the viscous damper can be different but stress continuity, as if we make a cut anywhere in that system, we'll have the same stress as the overall stress required to produce a strain.